kiddos, today we're going to talk about valence and ions. We've been talking for the past few videos about electrons and electron configurations. And we mentioned at the beginning of that that electrons are really the heart of everything that happens in chemistry. The chemical reactions happen because of things that happen with electrons. And more specifically, what is really at the heart of 90% of chemistry, 95%, 98%, I don't know, I'm just making up numbers, a large percentage of chemistry is what happens with valence electrons. Valence electrons, by and large, are the electrons that perform reactions, the ones that are going to form ions that we're going to show today, the ones that obviously those ions are going to lead to ionic bonds, the electrons that are shared in the formation of covalent bonds, the electrons that form up the, some, the majority of the sea of electrons and metallic bonds. Everything there comes down to our valence electrons. So what are valence electrons? And most of you probably talked a little bit about valence electrons in middle school. Remember that your valence electrons are your electrons in your outermost energy level. And so if we drew these things according to a Bohr model, and of course we don't draw things according to Bohr model most of the time, um, but we'll talk about the electron configuration here in a little bit. But on your Bohr model, your outermost energy level, so sodium nucleus here, I've got first energy level, second energy level, first level is completely full, second level is completely full, third level has one electron in it. So what we would say then is that for the sodium, that in its normal natural state, this sodium with all of its normal 11 electrons, which is what we have here, sodium has one valence electron. If we look over here at this fluorine, we can see that fluorine has seven valence electrons because its highest energy level is the second energy level. Okay, so two in the first level, seven in the second. So how do we know how many valence electrons there are without drawing that out or without drawing out the electron configuration that we'll do here in a second? What's well, actually pretty simple, if you look at the periodic table here, and you'll notice I didn't put in the F block, we're, gonna, we're not going to worry too much about the F block or really even the D block right now because for everything that we're going to do in Chem 1, what matters for valence is what's in the S and P, and we'll, you'll see why here in just a second. So the way that we would typically find how many valence electrons are in something is that we would look at the periodic table, we would start over here on the left-hand side of the periodic table, and we would count until we get to our element. Specifically, we don't count every box, we count the boxes um, that are just in the S and P orbitals. In other words, we're going to skip the D orbital, okay? So what does that mean? Well, if I'm doing sodium, sodium's in the first column, so it has one valence electron. That's pretty straightforward. If we were over here doing fluorine, we would say we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven valence electrons. If you were going to neon, which is next to fluorine, it's got one, two, three three, four, five, six, seven, eight valence electrons. Okay, well, what, what if you were down here lower in the table and you were down, um, say, and there were D block stuff in the way? What if you were down here at, say, bromine or something like that? Well, you would do the same principle. All, the only thing that would be different is that you're going to skip the D block. So I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, what you notice is that bromine's in the same column as fluorine. They're going to have the same number of valence electrons. They're going to have the same ending electron configuration. And in fact, to go back to what we already know about the periodic table, this is what actually the periodic table is set up on. We said that it's set up according to atomic number, which it is. But atomic number is what leads us into the number of electrons that something has. We also said that the periodic table is set up according to properties, which it is. But the properties are, are largely determined by their valence electrons, because the valence electrons, the number of valence electrons that they have, the electrons in the outermost energy level, are what actually determine how they react and what their properties are, okay? And so the periodic table really, although we say that it's set up by atomic number and um, by properties, which is true, both of those things essentially come back to one thing, which is electrons, and specifically, valence electrons, that's how we set up the periodic table. That's why everything is sort of lined up in the way that it is. That gives you sort of the easy way to tell immediately what the valence number is for any given atom. And the way that we do that is, you'll notice that if you look at a periodic table, that, that the groups of the periodic table were sort of numbered, one, two, three, four, all the way over to 18. Okay, so noble gases are group 18. But if you're looking at a good periodic table, what you probably also noticed is that they were given Roman numerals as well. And so you had 1a, 2a, 3a. And then if you look through here, you would see b. Well, here's the trick. Since you're only worried about s and p's 
for valence electrons. And again, I'm going to show you the electron configurations here in a second. You'll see why. Since you're only concerned about S and P's, you're just counting across. There's really only eight possibilities there. And the group A elements, the ones that have A after their Roman numerals, the number in front of them just tells you what the valence is. And so this over here is 8A. And so 8A tells me, since that's a group A, tells me that all of the noble gases have eight valence electrons, with that one obvious exception of helium. We already started to talk about helium. Helium goes over here because it behaves like a noble gas, but electron configuration-wise, it goes here because it ends in S, right? Okay, so, and again, there are some exceptions in chemistry, but that's generally how it works. So you can just sort of immediately know, look at the column that they're in and know how many valence electrons there. And if you know the first couple of rows pretty well, which you will, because you'll work a lot with oxygen and carbon and nitrogen and those things, then you'll know that, hey, um, so oxygen is here, nitrogen is here. So a nitrogen, let me write that in real quick so you see where we're going. So nitrogen is one, two, three, four, five. That means everything in that column is five. So the phosphorus below it also has five valence electrons. The arsenic below that also has five valence electrons. Everything in the same column has the same number of valence electrons. Let's tie that in real quick to um, our electron configurations as well. So if we wrote our electron configuration out for sodium, we would have 1s2, okay, 1s, 2s2, 2p6, okay, so we did 2s2, 2p, we filled that up, and then we end over here at 3s1. So what's the highest energy level? Remember that your energy levels are the coefficients, right? Okay, so my highest energy level is three. How many electrons are in that energy level? Well, just the one, the one and the three S. What about over here for fluorine? Well, let's write our electron configuration for that real quick. One S2, two S2, two P5. Okay, how did they get there? One S2, two S2, two P, one, two, three, four, five. So that becomes that. What's the highest energy level? Well. In this case, it's two is the highest energy level, not the highest sublevel, but the highest energy level. And so that means that I'm gonna add up both of those twos together. I'm gonna add two plus five, which gives me seven, which is how many valence electrons I have in fluorine. So how do you find the number of valence electrons? You count from left to right, or if you have an electron configuration, you look at your highest energy level, okay? And you take all of those together and that becomes your valence electrons. You shouldn't. And if you ever get a case where you've got more than eight valence electrons, you have done something terribly, terribly wrong. There's only eight possibilities because there's only two S columns and six P columns. And so those two together add up to be eight. So how does all of that lead us then to, how does all the stuff that we just talked about with valence and how to count across and look at the order, look at the electron configuration and find out the valence electrons. How does all of that then lead us into ions and bonding and that stability that we're looking for? Well, everything as far as stability for atoms comes down to the fact that the most stable state is what we call the NGEC. The NGEC is the noble gas electron configuration. And what that means is that we're gonna, the atoms are going to try to change themselves in such a way, they're going to move their electrons around in such a way, so that they all end up with noble gas electron configuration. You might have heard teachers say that they want to have a certain number of electrons, usually eight, okay, because that's a full octet. That's the octet rule. Um, it doesn't have to be eight. Obviously, helium only has two, and so hydrogen and helium aren't trying to get to eight. They can't hold eight. They were only in the first level. The first level won't hold eight. And so they're trying to get to two. Essentially, everything is more stable when it has a noble gas electron configuration. When we say they're trying to get to something or they want something, obviously that's not the case. It's a more stable situation if they have a noble gas electron configuration. That's why, that's why noble gases are noble gases because they're really stable and therefore they don't want to react with things. So noble gas electron configuration is what they're shooting for, okay? Well, in this case, neither of these two things have a noble gas electron configuration right now. For increased stability, it would be more beneficial if they did something that either added or removed electrons, or we'll see later when we do covalent bonding, if they shared electrons in some way, so that they could then get to a noble gas electron configuration. So here's the way that that's gonna work. Things on the left-hand side of the staircase, the metals, 
Metals tend to give up their electrons, their valence electrons. They get rid of their um, electrons because usually, in pretty much all of those cases, they're going to have four or less valence electrons. And so if they get rid of their electrons, that will make them more stable. And I'll show you how that works here in a second. For non-metals, things to the right of the staircase, they're going to tend to gain electrons, okay? Because it tends to be most of the time that they have four or over electrons already, and so it's a lot closer for them to gain electrons to get to the eight that gives them the noble gas core or the noble gas electron configuration. That's in general what is a, an easier to achieve stability than to lose them, okay? So metals are going to lose electrons, nonmetals are going to gain electrons. That's going to lead us into two different types of ions. So let's look at how that happens. So sodium, we said, is a metal, obviously. Sodium has one valence electron right there. You can see it right there. It's the electron in 3s1. Fluorine has seven valence electrons, okay? And remember that what we're sort of shooting for here um, is our good friend, the octet rule, okay? The octet rule is, is basically a fancy way of saying noble gas elect, uh, electron configuration. The octet rule says that for increased stability, the atoms are going to try to have eight valence electrons. And again, with the exception there of hydrogen and helium, those can make some um, exceptions. Lithium is going to be an exception as well. The really small ones are exceptions. They're going to try to get to noble gas electron configuration. And most of the time, that means having eight valence electrons. So how can I get to that? Well. This sodium has one, and we said that metals are going to lose, lose their electrons. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove that one valence electron there, okay? If I remove that one valence electron, then what I'm also doing is I'm removing it here as well, right? That's what I removed was that 3s1 electron. And now I have a situation where level 3 is no longer my highest occupied energy level, this outermost level here. It's not occupied, there are no electrons in it. My highest occupied energy level in the sodium now is here, and as you can see, we have eight electrons. You can see it there, and you can see it if you look at the electron configurations. Energy level two is now my actual highest occupied energy level, and there are two plus six is eight valence electrons now, okay? And what's really cool here is we said that we're trying to get the noble gas electron configuration. Well, what noble gas does that get us to? Well, that gets us to our good buddy neon over here. Neon has an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Highest energy level is 2, 8 electrons. You'll notice that that is the exact same thing as this sodium is after it loses its electron. Now, once it loses its electron, it is no longer a simple everyday sodium. It is now a sodium ion, specifically, it has an Na+. Plus. Now, why does it have a plus? It seems really weird that you would lose something, lose an electron, and then get a positive charge. Well, remember that electrons have a negative charge, right? And so if you lose a negative, that makes you more positive. Think about your own attitude. If you got a bad attitude on a day and somehow you lost the negativity, then you would be more positive, right? And so that's exactly what happens. We can explain that in terms of protons and electrons as well. Sodium has 11 protons, which means 11 positive charges. It had 11 negative charges, but we removed one of them. So now it only has 10 negative charges. And so if we add those things together, we're left with a one positive, which gives us our sodium ion, okay? so. The question that should be sort of obvious in your mind then is, hey, what happened to that one electron then? Well, here's what happened. Metals give up their electrons. Nonmetals are going to gain electrons. So that one electron that we lost, what if we took that one electron that we lost from that sodium and we came over here and we put it on that fluorine? That fluorine now went from having seven to having eight, good. What happened to the electron configuration? Well, that electron configuration now is 1s, that doesn't change, but the valence, the twos here, we had two in the s and we had five in the p, but we added another one, so now we have 2p6, which you may note does a couple of things. First off, two plus six is eight, that's eight valence electrons, we've satisfied the octet rule, and 
that is the exact same electron configuration as we had for neon. That is the noble gas electron configuration. That's what we were looking for. By the way, that means that fluorine is no longer fluorine. It is fluoride. Okay? The anions, we actually change the name of them at the end. They become IDE at the end, and we'll get a little bit more into that when we talk about naming later on. That is now a fluoride ion. If we put those two things together, we would get a sodium fluoride. Sodium fluoride is the stuff that's in your toothpaste um, to prevent tooth decay. It's also why you shouldn't swallow it, though, because sodium fluoride is poisonous, um, certainly in, in very large doses. So don't eat your toothpaste. Spit it out. Okay, so sodium fluoride there. So we got to a noble gas electron configuration. We've got two ions here. The other thing that you need to know is that they have names, not just the ions themselves. Those obviously have names, fluoride and sodium. You don't change the name of a, a metal. You would just say that it is a sodium ion as long as that thing only forms one type of ion, which we'll talk a little bit about later, but everything in the first two columns, they only form one type of ion. It's this D block stuff here that forms other weirdness. Okay, what about the D block stuff? What if we did that? Well, if you wrote electron configuration for anything in the D block, okay, you would still see that your highest energy levels are still gonna be your um, S and your P, because remember the Ds are always one level below. So this is level four here, right? So this is 4S, 4P, but this is 3D. So even if you went all the way over to here, um, then, and you had all these D electrons, your highest energy level is still gonna be your 4S there. And so it's still only the S and P electrons that are going to determine valence. Um, the last thing that I want to make sure that you know here in this video is that things with positive charges have a specific name. They're called cations. Things with um, negative charges have a specific name. They're called anions. Um, and it's really important to me that you actually call them properly. They're cations and anions. They're not cations and anions, even though it sort of looks that way um, pronunciation-wise. So cations, anions, cat means positive, and means negative. You'll see a little bit more of that if you take some higher level science classes, you start talking about positive and negative cathodes and anodes and stuff like that. That, by the way, cathode, cation, that's where some of that stuff is going to come from. So just keep that in mind. Um, cathode means positive, anion means negative, and that's the essential basics of how we find valence electrons and how we use them, um, how we can look at that to be able to form ions because we're looking for a noble gas electron configuration. All right, thanks kiddos.